Today, I'm joined by John Check, Executive Director of Cyber Protection Solutions at Raytheon. John, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Simone. I'm delighted to be here. Great. Well, I know Raytheon has been leading the charge on talent and workforce for years, sponsoring initiatives that tackle the issue like the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition and developing your own experiential learning. Can you tell me a little bit more about those efforts? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, well, Simone, as you know, Raytheon is very focused on security. Um, so one of the key things that in building a quality security team is really focused on efforts that not only help Raytheon itself, but also help with the whole community. So in that regards, there's a couple of things that we're, we've been very focused on. We've been a sponsor for the uh, National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition for many years now. Um, that's a competition that's between different colleges and universities, usually somewhere close to 200, that has um, regionals and then finals and ultimately a national champion in cyber defense where the students are defending a fictional company against cyber attacks. And those cyber attackers are red teamers that are very experienced uh, in the world and know exactly what to do. And the students learn a lot from that. So that experiential training is really very helpful. Uh, something else we're very focused on is the U.S. Cyber Games. That's something that we we're founded founding sponsor for. Uh, that where that's really more of a community building where the U.S. Cyber Team competes internationally um, on cyber competitions. And there's a combine. It's just like uh, the NFL or any other professional sports where there's a there's a whole process that the team goes through to get created. Uh, and that's really focused on people more 18 to 24 years old. So it's a different group, a little bit different than the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. So that's another uh, more of a community building and really helping grow the cyber talent in general across um, across the United States and elsewhere and our partners. Uh, as well as something really exciting we're doing within Raytheon is our Raytheon Offensive Labs. Um, I'm talking fast because I'm really excited about this. I mean, our Offensive Labs is something that where we create experiential training based on the roles that we are building towards within our business. So for example, we are upskilling or reskilling existing employees to help meet certain mission needs, or we bring in uh, people that are new to the workforce or less experienced, and then take them through a tailored training course that could be up to 16 weeks to really provide them that differentiated training that they might not have. And that's typically instructor-led. It's very uh, focused by industry experts, and it's trying to teach a defender to think like an attacker, which is not typically training that people receive in a in a, in a normal curriculum. That's fantastic. You know, one of the things that always strikes me when you think about the things that you're describing that are for external community building in the talent area, but then internally, I want to go a little bit more in depth on the offensive labs um, kind of university structure that you have. How are you, how is that working for you guys so far? And how are you measuring success as you see cohorts come out of that program? So really, some of the measures, so we started that in uh, 2022, um, so we've had our first two cohorts come out of that. Uh, more than 100 students have been through the process now, been through that the training. And really, we measure it two ways. One reason we did it was because, like everybody else, we were struggling to fill some cybersecurity roles. So we said, okay, Raytheon manufactures things. Let's manufacture talent. That's a great idea, right? Everybody's talked about cyber training, but really put an extreme focus on it to ensure that we were getting people that are living the work every day on certain missions and then training people to be able to be effective on those missions. So the way we've seen, uh, the way we're measuring that is really, okay, are those people when they join the teams, are they effective in their roles? And, and are we getting the customer satisfaction we'd expect for that person really contributing to the missions that we're supporting? And that's one of the key ways we we focus on from a customer facing metric. From a Raytheon, it's the, okay, we have reduce the amount of open positions we have, we are filling the roles that our customers are expecting us to. And that's a very tangible way to measure the success of we're, we're filling the open positions, right? Versus looking for that perfect candidate that's never going to show up with all those skills we want. We're taking the initiative to train them. And it's a real investment by us, typically, like I said, up to maybe 16 weeks. Yeah. Well, and I do have any background into what was the impetus or the kind of catalyzing event that kind of made Raytheon think about taking this kind of manufacture talent perspective. And I asked the question because I've been in this space for a while myself, and I'd say one of the biggest challenges we have is having organizations step up and say, 
how do we think about this strategically as a team, as opposed to waiting for talent to kind of get created externally and then we bring them in? So was there a watershed moment that made, you know, the organization realize we need to really invest in this? Uh, well, I'd say it was during the, the pandemic is really, I think, what what really changed the dynamic of how you're going to hire, who you're going to hire, and, and how you can really interact with uh, potential uh, teammates or talent that you want to bring on board, right? Before then, you could go to different events, Black Hat, DEF CON, whatever, and you can have all, you can meet with individuals and talk about what you do and you know, can do a material almost like a hiring event. That was all lost, right, during that time period. And it became very hard to uncover the people that really you've got exciting roles for them potentially, but it's really hard to connect. So part of the, the attack we took initially was really training uh, internal folks, people that are already on board to say, okay, this person already has these skills. They have the right uh, clearances required for this type of work. Let's get them into the training curriculum that will tailor, you know, be very specific to their needs and really ensure that they have those skills. So we really started more with our internal folks and then really migrated to more of a, okay, we're going to hire external candidates uh, and train them up. Because with the next, with an internal person, you already understand where they are in their, their maturity of their, their, their talent level and the skills that they have. Whereas an external person, it's much harder to gauge that no matter how thorough or how much of a, maybe a role-based assessment you do. It's very difficult when it's an external candidate. Yeah. So how are you, how is Raytheon thinking about those team skills that are needed to execute on these job roles that are in demand, not only internally, but from your own customers? Well, I mean, there's the, it's the, it ultimately comes down to the soft skills for us, right? Which typically is, is somebody a continuous learner, right? Are they going to, that's what it requires. You can't be afraid to fail. You've got to be able to somebody that's go, okay, I'm going to try to learn a new skill. It's going to be difficult. I'm going to get frustrated, but I'm going to keep per persevering. And really, you know, that perseverance trait helps, you know, in all aspects of cybersecurity. Because that's what, one of the things we do is when you're going after, your, your, see, there's a new threat that's emerged, doing the forensics to figure out, okay, what's happening? How did it happen? Who's doing it? How do we stop it? What's the remediation? All those things come into somebody. You have to be very, you have to be a, you have to a lot of perseverance to get through that process because it can be very frustrating with a, a lot of maybe dead ends or long nights and other activities where it, it, it takes the right uh, mindset as well. So we really, we look for people that have those, those skills, somebody that's inquisitive, right? They always are asking why, well, why, why does it work this way? What, what, what could we do differently? You know, all the, all the, the, the soft skills really lead to, because what we found is if you have somebody that has those committed soft skills, they can learn any content that's brought to them. Typically, they if they have those those the, the desire to do it, it it it's going to they're going to learn, be effective, and be a very effective teammate on whatever mission they are going towards. Um, you mentioned that participants in the cohorts that have come out of the offensive um, lab so far have actually had tailored curriculums to the roles they're being placed in. How are those curriculums being developed and deployed based on? needs so we 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 have a, a basically a, like a take a cyber academy approach to it so there's obviously a whole level of course work and course the courses that we have created um, which we do supplement with some commercial courses where it's where it's needed right we don't we don't we can't build everything as much as we like to build everything here ourselves there's certain things that just doesn't make sense right that may be more foundational if it's a certainly a foundational aspect but when it comes to our course we treat it like anything else we build the course load. And it's typically the way we approach it is much more hands-on uh, than a, than a, than a, than a, than a, um, a web-based type or on, on demand type training. We really focus on that true experiential training that you won't get by doing uh, a typical uh, online type training. So it really tries to drive very hard because that allows the instructor to truly understand where the skills gaps may be with the individual student, which then leads into more tailoring of, okay, here's the specific things. I thought potentially you would go down this one track, but based on how you're performing here, we can shorten that to two days, but here's a different area that has been exposed that maybe we should work on. And that's one of the, the key aspects that helps us be very uh, agile and flexible in that training process to ensure that we're getting the training to the individual at the right level they need it, and not just a, a training that you know somebody's flipping through slides saying, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know all this stuff. When are we going to get to the stuff I don't know? We really try to ensure that we don't have that type of downtime when we're doing the training. Fantastic. 
Um, switching gears just slightly, knowing that Raytheon certainly has been doing quite a bit, both in the public sector as well as the private, what are some of the ways that you think about um, how there can be better collaboration between the public and the private sector as we talk about how to solve this talent gap problem beyond what we're even seeing in individual organizations? Well, uh, so the way I really look at the talent problem is has three key aspects with a lot of uh, of of side side you know spokes to it. So the first thing is the, we got to solve the quantity problem. Got to remove artificial barriers of entry to people that want to join the cyber fight, and also people that aren't even thinking about it, giving them the awareness that hey, that sounds interesting, and maybe I'd want to join doing that. Two is we talked about it already. Once you have that, you got to you got to create the quality, right? You got to build a quality workforce when that quantity you're bringing in. And a third is you got to support them once they've reached that goal, which that gets to the, the aspects around, okay, the continuous training, tailored tailored uh, role-based training that they will need, but also all those soft things of avoiding burnout, of ensuring people's voices are heard. When they see something they then and, and they provide a suggestion, people follow up on it. And ensuring that the... Um, the organization as a whole makes it a priority to do all those things. So it's easy to say there's a cybersecurity problem and we don't have enough people, but are people taking an active role? And that's what I'd like to think that we are taking an active role, uh, you know, participating in, in all the events that we can, right, with, from a STEM perspective with NCCDC and U.S. Cyber Games and other events, as well as having our own internal lab to train people, as well as trying to remove those barriers on our job postings and not say thou shall have, you know, X number of, you know, I have a four-year degree with this type of coursework, with this GPA, with these certifications, and all those things that are are really a wish list and really trying to say, if you have these skills and you're determined to do these types of things, we can train you. And that's really a, a real mind shift for us as well, because you know Raytheon's a, a, a company of engineers. And we take engineering very serious, but we recognize we can't do it by the traditional pathways alone. We have to open that that aperture and not have that artificial limiting of potential candidates that can join the workforce. Right. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, not to keep, you know, we've we've talked about a lot of great um, proactive and, and beneficial programs here, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask. What are some of the challenges that you see in executing not only the initiatives within inside Raytheon, but just other public private collaborative attempts to to solve the talent issues across the industry? Um, and and how do we kind of address how we can make a more signif statistically significant gap in that short? Well, I think that so I think one of the key things is we we have to really build the ecosystem and community. One of the things that really I've been thinking about over the past, certainly the last three years has really dawned on me, get into these, these discussions and everybody's talking about their, their own individual attrition, right? All our, woe is me, our company lost this many people to attrition. They're all going somewhere else. The only regrettable attrition is somebody is so burned out, they leave the cybersecurity field, right? One of the, my team members during the pandemic left cybersecurity to start his own car rental company. And when I thought about that, I was like, that is truly regrettable. That person is a subject matter expert that we will have a hard time replacing. And I'm not saying he was burned out. Maybe he just wanted to try something new. And and the, the, the car rental business was something he'd always been interested in. But again, that's a regrettable attrition to the community at large, not just to Raytheon. So I'm always, I'm thrilled when some of our teammates that are at Raytheon move on to new roles that go to bigger and better things, because now they're part of that community that we can rely on. And that, you know, there's no cybersecurity is a team sport, but it's also a team sport at the highest macro level, right? Where it's it's it's, pub, it's private sector, public sector, all collaborating to solve the same problems. They get down to a very tactical level when you're talking about your own business or your own customer set. But at a, at, a, at the highest level, those problems are problems that typically affect a wide swath, lots of people, and it's very... Um, it's something you collaborate on to really make a huge difference with. Your example is so interesting because, you know, in many of the conversations I've had, um, it's come up that we don't so much have a talent problem, but an experience problem. Um, and so while there are some great initiatives to upskill and reskill, 
you know, talent into the cybersecurity field from an entry level perspective, what are some of the ways you are thinking about retention or how to at least minimize what you call regrettable departures from the field? Because you're right. We we all suffer as an industry when someone chooses to leave. And that experience is something that can't be replicated immediately. That's right. So, so one thing is, uh, one of the things that uh, I created when I got to Raytheon was Cyberlandia. Um, so it's a place where everybody is empowered to get the job done that they need to. They can get the training they need to complete the work. They have the support they need, which means if they need to tap out and say, hey, I'm, I'm really, you know, I've reached to my limit. I need to take a day off. We give them the space to do that, but also ensure that everybody's voice is heard, which truly means when there is something that needs to be changed, everybody feels no matter wh where they are in their career journey, which from the person that just started with Raytheon to the person that's been here for you know 20 years, they, they know that they can say something to help us improve what we're doing and really trying to put a focus on that. And that's hard because you know, a lot of times the, the job that we have, the, 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 um, our adversaries don't always work in the same timelines as us. They, sometimes they like to pick holidays. Sometimes they like to pick nights and weekends. That's what it seems like it always is. I'm sure that's not the case, but and that's a, that can be very demanding, not only in the individual, but also in their families and that support system that relies on them. And that's really one of the, the key things is ensuring that people understand that this that we are we have a culture where if you need help, please say something. If you you know, and, and within you know the the shift to a lot of work from home type activities, people don't have those offhand conversations as much where they just run into somebody in the office. So really also ensuring one of the things I always encourage the team, talk to somebody you haven't talked to today. Just call them out of the blue on our teammate. Find out how they're doing. Don't ask them about work-related things. Just ask them how they're doing. And I think it makes a huge difference because that's one of the things that gets lost. Every, especially if you're sitting at home, you just don't have the support maybe that you you, you could get otherwise to really uh, talk about the things that may be stressing you out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we started this conversation <laughs> saying how cybersecurity is a team sport. And I think that we're ending kind of demonstrating that throughout the entire life cycle, it's still a team sport. We talk a lot around our parts about how it is a version of Moneyball, where we're often looking, you know, through talent as a team base. I mean, we have the right people in the right roles, and then are they trained to do, you know, the work that they need to do in those positions? And it's really exciting to hear some of what you all are doing. So, Don, thank you so much for for joining us today, and appreciate the time. Thanks, Simone. It's been it's been great. I love this conversation. <laughs>